Okay, um, we're going to start. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank, uh, thank you for coming uh, to CSIS. My name is Romina Bandura. I'm a senior fellow at the Project for Prosperity and Development. We have uh, a very good panel today on the topic of procurement uh, as an engine of growth. Uh, we were just talking uh, previously about the term procurement. Um, we don't think it's it's a boring uh, topic at all. I think we it's it's a very sexy topic. Uh, it just that it might need a, a little uh, rephrasing. Uh, I, I suggested that the term should maybe be uh, changed to government shopping or something like that. Uh, so we get a little bit more excited. Uh, but we're, we do have an exciting panel today. Uh, first of all, um, Martin Sanov is product manager uh, of the company Monitor.com, and he's going to present uh, a very interesting tool from BizPortal. Um, next to him is um, Leslie Harper. She's a, a specialist uh, in the Fiscal Management Division Department of the Inter-American Development Bank. Andrea Lapo is director for program, global programs at the U.S. Trade and Development Agency. Georg Neumann is Senior Communications Manager at the Open Co Contracting Partnership. And um, finally, um, Robert Bur Burton is Partner at Crowell Mooring, uh, a government con a contracts group. So the idea, we'll, we'll have a, an hour discussion and then we can uh, open up for, for some Q&A from, from the public. Let me kick off um, with Martin and his his initiative, we've you know procurement is 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 such a big uh, part of of of, com of developing com uh, countries' GDP. It moves around 20 percent or more of uh, developing countries' GDP, and we've seen a lot of scandals lately in you know Latin America and elsewhere on on corruption, uh, you know infrastructure co contracting, etc. Can you tell us about, about how this portal is looking into uh, these issues and how it can provide more transparency to systems, procurement systems? Thank you, Romina. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Martin Sanov. I'm the product manager for the company Monitor.com, which is a global contract, a public procurement contract awards database platform, analytical platform. Uh, designed and developed, as you said, by Bisporto. Uh, we are a, a data publishing company based in Bulgaria, but we uh, uh, we monitor from open data, open uh, feed, open data feeds information uh, globally. With our uh, main specialty uh, being public procurement, and in particular contracts, contracting, uh, contract awards. Uh, so when we initially discussed this event. Uh, we were talking about uh, showing how data science could actually uh, help uh, I increase transparency or at least uh, uh, help whistleblowers uh, in, in, uh, in monitoring and uh, having more information or some in, uh, insights about suspicious activities, in particular anti-corruption, as you said, uh, suspicious money flows, money laundering, if you, if you wish. Um, uh, obviously, uh, in addition to the date, to data science, there is, and some of the other panelists actually today will talk about overall modernization of public procurement and digitalization of the process by using full, full transaction e-procurement systems, uh, which is something directly involved with the data that we, we collect. Uh, but uh, going back to your uh, question, we work with uh, a number of uh, data dis global data distribution partners, namely Bureau Van Dyke, a Moody's analytics company, uh, and independently, and through that partnership, we have been involved in a number of government initiatives. Uh, maybe worth mentioning is uh, uh, that we are a da data provider to a university research center, economic crime research center in Italy, that is participating in the DigiWist project which is one of the most significant fiscal transparency projects in, uh, uh, in, in Europe, focusing not only on European Union countries, but also on the neighboring exceeding Balkans countries, Central Asian countries, uh, uh, and the Caucasus countries. Uh, so we have been involved with all kinds of stakeholders in the process, and I could tell you that uh, 
regardless of the origin of the project, funding, etc., these global data uh, projects kind of have uh, a few main contributions to, to, to increasing transparency or at least putting, putting the, the light on the discussion of, uh, of uh, procurement, at, uh, innovation and transparency. First, uh, it is important that we, uh, we get the information from a lot of different sources at the same place in the same format uh, at the very basic level. Uh, a little bit more about the process of what we do. In a nutshell, we, we monitor all these government sources, so we <laughs> highly depend on what is available out there and, and the level of uh, transparency and uh, uh, digitalization of the procure government procurement processes. So we, we monitor a lot of sources, then we, we aggregate the information and standardize it in the same format which is a lot of the work that we are, uh, we are doing. This m one of the most challenging parts, actually. Uh, and then having those information retrieved on software algorithms uh, and uh, having the information in the same place, this allows cross-referencing comparisons between countries and regions, uh, etc. On another level, it, it definitely helps building a common procurement vocabulary. Because although there is, especially in Europe, but also I, I believe the UN and some developing institutions have put out their kind of common terminology on procurement, uh, there is still a lot, and data science could be very helpful in actually comparing apples and apples and uh, making sure that we, we, we are comparing the same kind of procedures because purchase orders and delivery orders in one country is, is different, different than purchase orders in, in another country or what in Europe, what's called a tender procedure is not always the same as what we have, for example, in the United States through framework uh, supply uh, agreements, etc. And then having all of that ideally in the same format, cleaned and standardized, uh, and this is the, I would say, where the most value added comes. Uh, of course, doing some analytics on, on this information, uh, providing insights, risk analysis, especially if we're discussing anti-corruption, uh, but also for commercial purposes for small and medium businesses, being able to, to predict and forecast information and thus uh, being able to actually uh, embark and enter the public procurement market. Uh, the, from the analytics, at least what, what we do at the company monitor, it's we have uh, we, we work on kind of two points of views. One is the macroeconomic perspective, uh, and the other one is really analysis on micro granular level, on supplier and buyer level, meaning uh, doing company profiling but also institutional profiling. Uh, here today, actually, I, I believe the micro level for public procurement is much more interesting and, uh, uh, and, and it's, it's insightful in a way. Today, uh, we, I'll, I'll show really quickly, without taking too much time, some of the, some of the analysis we are doing. Uh, uh, basically, uh, having consolidated information from all countries, uh, people interested in this information could filter by contract awards frequency, number of contracts acquired by uh, any companies, and then uh, they could rank the, those companies and see uh, see what, for example, is the most popular country, uh, the most successful company in construction in Mexico, or even in a certain location in Mexico, because we do it on uh, sector level, local level, national level, and also we do regional comparisons. Uh, more, more interestingly, uh, we have, uh, what we call the, uh, the, the alerting system, uh, where we have flags about recent activity success, for example, the, the, uh, the notable recent activity success, which is the, the number, it, it could be ranked by contract awards frequency, also by number of, uh, by, by uh, value of contracts acquired by a company in, for the last 12 months as compared to the average. Uh, to the average numbers for the last five or ten years. I forgot to mention that we have archive going back ten years for some countries even even more. Uh, of course, this is just some alerting. <laughs> it's not our job to point fingers or, or anything like that. Uh, but this is some of the analysis. And then I am sorry that we, we actually faced some diff technical difficulties here. I don't know how much you see. <laughs> but this is actually a company profile. 
uh, I believe one of the most successful companies in um, uh, in the pharmaceutical sector in Mexico in terms of uh, getting uh, contract awards. Uh, so all the information that you see or you don't see. Uh, how, many how many countries do you cover? Uh, we cover uh, 45 countries. All the countries from the European Economic Zone, uh, Mexico, Colombia, Chile, Brazil from Latin America, uh, uh, USA, Canada on federal level, and to some extent on state and county level, Australia, India, Singapore, and South Korea. Uh, we are constantly working on having, uh, on increasing geographical coverage, but uh, actually I'll mention some of the challenges and uh, uh, some of the challenges that we face in, uh, in uh, retrieving the information or actually just having any information about procurement. So, uh, can see, but this is uh, there is a distribution of, of, of contract awards by sector. But what is more importantly, you could see the the state agencies that have been in a way m most generous to a certain company. Uh, the same analytics goes on the other side, on the buyer side. So you could see a certain state agency and all the companies that they have provided awards to in, and, uh, in terms of number of contracts, but also value of contracts generated. This is obviously an interactive information. We update the, all this data um, on a weekly basis uh, because it's not only archive, but every day there are new contracts coming, uh, coming out. From a macroeconomic perspective, we, we do some market sizing in terms of value of contracts in a certain nation or a, a certain uh, region, even per city. Uh, also, um, number of contracts, value of contracts acquired. But what I, I find my mo more interesting is number of companies involved in, the, in, in public procurement, which shows the, the level of competitiveness because uh, uh, this, is, this is quite important. For example, here you could see the number of companies for the last per year, uh, for the last four years in four Latin American countries, which is showing little to no movement in terms of competitiveness of the market. Uh, I believe there is also, it's not here, but we, um, uh, the, the, the same information could be, could be uh, is available per industry, for example, pharmaceutical construction industry in a certain city, in a certain, uh, uh, in, in a certain country, per, per year, per quarter, per monthly, et cetera. Uh, as I said, and going back to the company analytics, uh, I mentioned our partnership with uh, Bureau Van Dyck, which is now a Moody's, Moody's analytics company, and uh, having our procurement information on, on one side, which could be also found in their information products, uh, and comprehensive com private company information which they, they, they offer. There is, a, there is a number of additional analytics that we're developing, some of them especially with a focus on suspicious activity, risk alerts, etc. cetera. Uh, for example, uh, comparing the value of contracts acquired through procurement and the overall revenue of a company because it is quite quite often it is the case that there are companies where nearly 95% of income comes from public procurement, which is uh, an interesting case at least. Also companies with low credit ratings, but with very high success with the government. Uh, uh, of course companies, there is a lot of analysis that is, that is being done with uh, uh, date of registration of companies because it's very often the, 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 the case that there are vehicles company vehicles created just for participation in a certain procedure. Uh, there is through, through, through the Orbis uh, ownership and subsidiary too, uh, we are, uh, there, there is the possibility and we are developing integrators about uh, ownership of companies that have been successful with the government. Uh, sometimes it's, especially when we look at the global ultimate ownership information, it is it's interesting to find if there's any offshore participation. There was a lot of, actually there were a lot of efforts in Europe at least on actually banning offshore managed uh, owned companies in, in, from participation in government contracting. So all of that are just uh, some, of the, some of the analysis that could be done through the data. Uh, and of course, and through cross-referencing with other data sets, 
mostly company information institution. Yeah, you do have a question? No, perfect. No, I wanted to maybe follow up with, and we can, we'll come back to the data issue, um, on the transparency issue with, with Georg and his open contracting uh, partnership. You worked also at the IDB, now you're in this new initiative. Can you tell us a little bit about what uh, you know, open contracting partnership does and how do you see this role of technology and data um, that Martin is working on uh, as, you know, as, as, as a driver for more transparency in procurement systems. Thanks, Romina, and, and thanks for inviting me to, to this panel. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think you've mentioned it, that we're dealing here with really a, a market that is about $10 trillion globally, and more importantly, for each government, it's the area that they spend most money of, uh, so going up to 50%, 60% in some of the developing countries, Overall, it's about 12, 30 percent uh, of GDP for, for OECD countries. So it really shows you like how important that issue is for government. So it's even more important and surprising sometimes to know that government doesn't know where it, get, where it spends this money on. So what we do as the Open Contracting Partnership and through this idea of open contracting is we try to help understand what, who, when, and how much government is actually spending um, through its contracting from the beginning to the end of, of the process. And that issue is more important than ever, and it's not an issue that is only for developing countries, but also for developed countries. If you've uh, followed the news yesterday, especially in the UK, you've seen that the largest or second largest contractor, construction contractor and public service provider has gone broke. Um, so what happens to all these contracts? So if you look at the official um, systems online, like what this $2 billion or like which are the contracts that, um, that they're covering. Uh, if you look online, you only find 10 contracts um, covering about you know, 10, 20% of the whole cost. So this lack of transparency is, uh, is not only something that is a problem within government, but also externally uh, in terms of accountability and how decisions are being made when, um, when the government itself doesn't really know, okay, where is, um, you know, where are the risks? So there have been three risk warnings um, for, this for this company, um, but how, how has this been dealt with? So um, the Open Contracting Partnership uh, manages an open contracting data standard um, that provides government um, with a suggestion of which information to publish in a standardized format as open data. Um, and that covers it from the planning stage to the implementation stage. Um, and this is actually, and then based on that, we engage with different users, um, the government itself, um, in terms of efficiency and value for money, um, with businesses in terms of like finding better opportunities, increasing their business, with civil society and media to monitor this, corrupt, uh, this construction process in terms of um, transparency and, and anti-corruption. Um, and finally, to get better services to citizens. Um, so these are the, the four use cases that the data is, is built around. And let me give you um, two examples for where this has been working really well. So we work globally. Um, we work in the UK. We're helping the UK government and starting to, to on this process. But we've also been working in Nepal, Colombia, Paraguay, and the Ukraine on implementing and, and getting better data out of their systems. So in Colombia, and I think this, this is in, a very, in, in Bogota specifically, this is a really interesting example because it shows you that open data is not just because it's open data and for transparency's sake. No, it is being used to implement better policies. So we've been, um, we've been telling a little bit the story of how in Bogota, the Ministry of the Secretary of Education for a city of about nine million um, uh, sort of people that live there, um, and they deliver 750,000 meals per day. So um, that is a lot of bananas every day. Um, and, and what they've been looking at is they've seen a lot of irregularities. They've seen their suppliers not being able to um, come up with the quality that they've wanted for their children to have. So they've looked at the process and see like, how can we get more competition? How can we get more transparent about telling parents of like, who are those that provide us with the food, and how can we do this? So they've turned to Colombia Complevisiente, the state procurement agency who's been implementing open contracting, who's been very transparent about this process and created a new process um, for that last year. So interestingly, um, throughout this process, they didn't get um, any bids for um, fruits, for dried fruits. 
Um, so they said, well, why is this? Are we too cheap? Are they too expensive? Or what's the problem? So um, they've gone through this process of analyzing the data and looking what is happening, and they've realized that there were actually companies that didn't like the new system, the new transparent system, and were trying to fix the prices 50% up. Um, so they found this information through, through the data, and they've changed it, and, and they've managed to, um, now the investigation is ongoing. But better than that is now that they have direct um, rela working relationships with the, with the providers, they're much better able to, to manage the quality of the system. And now this school feeding system in Colombia is the, the number one system in Colombia of like providing quality food to 750 children a day, which is, a, which is amazing. Um, and the other example, which I think is, is really interesting, is um, looking at Ukraine, likely sort of one of the countries that is seen as most corrupt um, in, in Eastern Europe. Um, and what they've seen is they've seen procurement as what it is, is sort of one of the key government functions. And they decided, will we scrap this paper-based system? And I think they had the, 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 the vantage point of like jumping over this gap of going from paper-based system to e-procurement technologies. Um, and there are some really good examples that have done that, like from Korea to Chile to others, and go directly to a fully electronic, open-based system um, ever. And I think and what they've seen is in implementing this, um, they've worked with uh, business and civil society, and they've seen a couple of key um, outcomes. One is they've, in, they've increased the competition by 50% for some of the agencies, um, and more importantly, they've increased SME participation to um, 75%. And this is data you can actually like calculate yourself if you go online and go into their um, business intelligence system, which is completely open. Um, other countries like the US or the UK, for example, struggling with getting SME participation of 25%, which is sort of like some of their goals. They've managed to get 75%. Um, and and they've um, and they've well, I mean, they've seen savings um, increase, but also they've seen civil society engaging in the monitoring process and finding areas where things haven't been going that well through a new system called DoZoro, which connects um, civil society complaints and monitoring reports to the um, what they call the ProZoro system, um, and. Um, and sort of fixing those issues as they go. So they have about a fixed rate of 50% of the issues raised towards fix them, which I think is another question of like, how are you accountable to the decisions that you take on and, and are you fixing when things, when issues are raised? No, and I think that goes a long way in creating this trust that we need um, between citizen, business, and government. Um, in moving and spending this like you know big chunk of money that is um, that is uh, the public procurement money that's spent on public procurement, um, so so I think that's that's where we see sort of some of the innovation going, some of the technology that's being developed on that, um, and I'd love to see. Um. Perfect, thank you, uh, Georg. Um, I wanted to go um, and ask uh, Andrea to talk about a little bit of what Georg was mentioning about you know, state capacity, and I know that USDD8 has been in the forefront of training local procurement officials. You have, um, in 2013, you launched this global procurement initiative on, on value-based procurement um, systems, mechanisms, sorry. Uh, you know, can, can you tell us a little bit more how, what, you know, what your role is and how you've been, um, you know, what, what challenges have you uh, dealt with in, in developing countries uh, in terms of, you know, of your training and, and the needs there? Thank you. Um, yes, uh, I'm from the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, which many of you may or may not know. Um, we're a very small um, trade promotion and development agency within the U.S. government. So a lot of people may be asking, how in the world did you get involved into procurement? Um, mm -hmm. We provide grants for feasibility studies to develop commercial infrastructure projects and large infrastructure projects in emerging economies around the world. So we are able to work in developing and middle-income countries to develop these, these quite large projects, all of which demand goods and services, and we want to promote international competition, greater competition and greater transparency in how these projects are being uh, 
implemented. And once we actually looked back and, and did some research on how the projects go forward, we, we saw that a lot of the project sponsors we were working with weren't happy with the results of the project. Um, and when we started digging a little bit, uh, we're, we don't actually get involved in the implementation. We're not the fiduciary. We don't finance the actual implementation. The country is in charge of doing that, and they can choose whatever financier they wish to work with. Um, but we, we started looking at some of the issues, and a lot of that was coming back to how the project was procured and how it was awarded and how it went forward. Uh, and we could see, see that they were discontent with what they ended up with. And so we wanted to go back initially and look at USTDA's policies and procedures and how we could fix that. So uh, over 10 years ago, we revamped our policies at TDA just to look at saying every grant that we give will have to look at life cycle cost analysis. It will have to inform the country on the total cost of ownership of this project so that they understand the financial burden they're about to undertake with this project and what it will be needed to actually maintain this asset throughout the life of the project. We thought that that was a responsible way to inform countries like it's not just the initial ticket price, you need to look at the total cost and that way you can maintain your asset throughout the life of the investment. So. We did that, but then we also wanted to figure out how we could do something more utilizing our tools. That is how we came about with a global procurement initiative. We knew that procurement is a very tricky and a very complicated issue. Uh, it's something that the U.S. government you know, did not want to be the one going around wagging our finger telling people how to do procurement. Um, that never works out well. And so we knew we needed to partner with experts. <laughs> spread the blame. <laughs> um, we have lots of lessons that we can share from the U.S. government perspective and how we've done things well and so we have may not have done things well. Um, but we knew that there's a body of international best practices on how you can get greater value for money in public procurement. And that's one of the key issues. How do I get greater value for money for these things? We're working in developing a middle income economies where they cannot afford to make these types of mistakes. They cannot afford to have a loan for 30 to 50 years on an asset that will fail on year seven and yet becomes a drain on the economy. So we needed to be able to teach them how to do life cycle cost analysis, total cost of ownership, and how do we do that. So we partnered with George Washington University. We partnered with some experts at MIT. We've partnered with nonprofit organizations, and we also have experts in individual industry fields because the way you develop projects in energy are very different from transportation projects, aviation projects, and the factors that have to be considered. So we created this huge body of knowledge with international experts, and we figured we needed to work with the multilateral development banks. So we partnered with the World Bank. We've also worked with the IDB on doing this type of training in individual countries where they have the procurement systems in place. It's just a matter of implementing and looking at the outcome and how do I get the best outcome for my money as opposed to how am I going to check all the boxes that I did everything correctly? How am I going to make sure that I actually get the quality standards that I'm looking for utilizing my laws and procurement rules uh, to get what I can provide the best services for? And of course, do this in a transparent manner and, and pro provide the documentation so that, that everyone in the country understands that it was done fairly or it was done in a way that increases competition or we're gonna do this in a way that promotes innovation. And, and it, we touch on everything from the project planning stage all the way through to implementation. And so we realize it's very important not only to just to train the practitioners, we're training auditors, we're training decision makers, we're training in some countries members of Congress who make the laws. And we're doing so uh, at every training with international organizations and multilateral development banks like the IDB, the World Bank. We partner with them mainly because we're a small agency and they've done a large body of work on what needs to be done in these countries. And they're working on multiple levels. And it actually takes a multifaceted approach to be able to impact change in these countries in procurement. And so partnering with folks like the World Bank and the IDB, where they've already put in significant time creating the institutions to support these stronger procurement regimes, and we're working with them to create change. And we kind of have the benefit of working on the real incentive part, because everybody can understand, I want better quality for a decent price. 
not necessarily cheapest price, but a decent price. And I want to be able to do this so that I can provide the best services to my citizens. And so the incentive piece is kind of where we, we have snuck in and, and been able to provide a program that at first we had no idea how it would be successful. We already have nine countries. I love how you mentioned Colombia Compra Eficiente. They were one of our first partners in Latin America. We have a partnership with them and we launched our program there last year. We've been working with them on a lot of their reporting, but also the value-based procurement mechanisms. And this is where we've been working with Leslie and her team and the INGP network that she'll talk a little bit more about, I'm sure, um, and how we have been able to kind of move the spectrum and in every country, we're not trying to move them to a U.S. model, by the way, even though we, we have some privileges in the U.S. system, but we also have a lot of safeguards in the U.S. system that allow us to have a little bit more flexibility. Uh, but there are also some things in the United States where we wouldn't want to have to transplant to another country. So that's why we work with international models and we let countries choose those models that would work best for them. Thank you, Andrea. Um, I want to uh, sort of liaise with what Leslie's doing at IDB because you mentioned training as a key component um, of you know c capacity building, but in modernization, in modernizing procurement systems, there are other aspects, and I know you've worked um, in many countries to reform the procurement system. So, my question is. How do you tackle um, you know, these big challenges that <laughs> the countries have? I mean, what, are, what is your approach? Um, how do you go about modernizing procurement systems? We, we mentioned training, we mentioned uh, transparency, data, technology. You know, what are other aspects that you look at? Thank you, Romina. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's a real pleasure to be here. So my name is Leslie Harper, and I lead the public procurement group at the IDB, Public Procurement Reform Group. So we provide, we're kind of a one-stop shop for public procurement in the, in, at the IDB in, in these reforms. And we, we work with the 26 IDB member countries through technical assistance or grants and through lending operations, including both investment and policy-based loans, providing expertise on reform policy, reforming policies, structuring agencies, professionalization, as you mentioned. So when we go to a country, the way we tackle reform, it's uh, um, obviously it's, uh, there's no one size fits all when it comes to public procurement. It's very different depending on the country. So what we usually do, first we do a, say a diagnostic assessment. Um, and here we oftentimes partner with other organizations who work with us on those to determine the status, needs, and main issues. Um, as the reform should be country driven, the country needs to have clear what they want to achieve so we can help in analyzing what they have and in designing action plans to overcome those gaps. And we generally look at three main, or four main areas when it comes to procurement reform. The first would be the legal and regulatory framework. Does the country have the right rules? Um, is, are they clear, comprehensive um, for acquiring goods, works, and services? Do they include the, you know, the basic principles of public procurement, transparency, efficiency, value for money? They, do they not just focus on procedures? And here, this is really important, you know, is it more, is it uh, go beyond that? Do they enable electronic transactions? Because a lot of countries, it's um, that's been a, a block to implementing electronic government procurement because they don't have it in the law, they don't go forward with it. Um, so those are the kind of things that we look at. Um, the second thing we often look at are the institutional arrangements. Do they have a public policy? Um, do they have a public procurement unit that does policy and monitoring? Um, and this is a very important point. I'm actually, I'm here with one of my co-authors. We wrote an article for our journal in, in the Journal of Public Procurement where we, one of the key factors or key elements in a public procurement reform is having an agency that can lead um, these, uh, these types of reforms. Because as we talked about, it's, public procurement reforms are very tricky. There's a lot of um, political interests in behind. And so having a, an agency that can help guide those reforms in a strategic fashion is very important. Um, and also for my, you know, making sure that the people are trained and so forth. The third thing we often look at are electronic, electronic government procurement. Um, and then the fourth thing is professionalization because if you don't have good public procurement officers, it's gonna be very hard. You're gonna have the old timey, you know, public procurement agent officer focusing on just the administrative tasks. Well, now we need to go much beyond that. It's more strategic function. Um, and so those are kind of the kind of the building blocks of public procurement. And it, but it, again, it depends on what level of development the country's at, and also the size of the public procurement market. For example, if the country's 200,000 people versus 200 million people, it's going to be a very different approach 
how you would go about, you know, maybe it doesn't make sense to have reverse auctions in a country with 10,000 people, you know, it doesn't, then we don't have the kind of market for that. So it's really country specific in that sense. In the more advanced countries, we often look at um, new modules such as, you know, framework agreements. I mean, framework agreements are not new, but I mean, in terms of making them electronic um, or looking at, you know, using the new data analytical tools. Um, but regardless of what we do, we, or what approach we take, we all, always take into account the entire system because it's very important that public procurement is not viewed as just, you know, um, separate processes, but rather an integrated system and integrated um, with the public financial management system. This is how it connects to other areas of government is very important because if, you know, your, your public financial management system isn't doing payments on time, it doesn't matter if you have a good procurement system, it's still going, you're still going to have issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Both Leslie and Andrea, you touched upon working with other institutions. Can you just provide an example of, um, you know, where you worked in a country or, uh, on, you know, together with the World Bank or, you know, uh, USDA with IDB, just to give a little bit more of a flavor of what kind of work you do together, yeah, jointly. Sure. Um, unfortunately, our colleague from uh, the MCC is not here today, and she she actually led a very innovative program in Indonesia that we were we're working with them on now because they've done a lot of the institutional work to build up that system to the point of where they're they're now capable and they have the institutions in place to kind of look at more value-based mechanisms. And again, that value-based mechanism approach, it opens the door for greater international competition because U.S. companies as well as European companies, Canadians or Australians, they offer a higher level of service and maintenance and opportunity that they're used to working on this, this mechanism. They can compete very well on this playing field um, and it opens the door for greater competition for, for everyone. And uh, we're looking at working with, and we've been working with Jean Marie on this as she's, as she's wrapping up that program there. We also have a partnership with the World Bank. We actually signed an agreement, a partnership agreement with the World Bank. And not just to be all fluff, we actually outlined very key areas that we wanted to work together to achieve some results. So we're working in individual countries. And for example, in Vietnam, we have a partnership agreement in Vietnam and we're working with the World Bank staff in Vietnam to help bring about change. USTDA and working with their government identified one of the key areas they've been working on data and e-government and, and e-procurement systems, but there's a lot of problems that they have incurred specifically with um, bad performers or poor performers in their market. And they, and they, you'll see that the same companies continue to win government contracts over and over again and yet they, they fail to perform sufficiently to deliver for the government. And so how do you do that in a way that's, that's transparent? How do you do that in a way that's fair? Uh, and so the government um, approached us and the World Bank on how do we establish a, perform, a past performance system for contractors because they wanted to be able to share that type of information across the government. Because if, it, if, if a contractor fails to perform or or defaults on a contract with one agency, why do they get to win 10 more contracts with other uh, government agencies to, do, to build? And so we're working together on that particular project. TDA provided a grant to do the design that will plug into the e-procurement system. We're working with them very closely. And again, it's helpful when you have all of the international donors and the international presence working in one room together to kind of work and move the ball forward because procurement as you can see, I mean, we talked about it, we're, we're talking briefly about it, but I guarantee you everyone sitting up here, we could talk to you about it all day, about the different, <laughs> the different problems and the challenges that we face. Um, but I will say just one universal statement, every government in the world faces the exact same challenges when it comes to procurement. The United States, UK, everyone from Botswana to South Africa, we all face the same challenges. They're just in different um, magnitudes and how we have to deal with them. And so, Every one of us has the same constituency. We have the same voices. I have constituents that want us to move faster, be more like businesses. I have constituents that want us to be um, uh, more like help our own. We ha every contract has to go to a local. You know, we have to help U.S. companies or we have to help, you know, U.K. companies. So they should always go to a local. Or we have those who are like, we need more rules. We need more. And it's a constant balance and struggle between those three voices that we all deal with. And so it's really helpful when we're working in environments where we're trying to impact change. We're trying to help them because as we've all, are, you've all heard the statistics, 
it's a huge, huge financial investment on the part of governments. And so how do we help them build their economies? Because ultimately, if, if you make a bad mistake in procurement, it's not one you can get over with over, overnight. <laughs> uh, it's one you have to live with for quite some time. So it's how do we help these folks? And then so in the IDB, just as an example, um, we've launched three programs, one in Panama, one in Colombia, one in Mexico, and we just launched one in Brazil. Actually, that's four programs. And we're working on the Dominican Republic, so that's five. And we've worked with the IDB at every, in every country, and we're working at the country level, but we also work at a policy level with the DC, DC office coordinating so that our work complements each other. Again, pushing that ball or pushing that, but, you know, that spectrum so that we can have and impact change together. Thank you. Well, on the, on the part of the IDB, we, we work together with the other organizations very closely, constantly collaborating. And one of the ways we do this is through the Intermarket Network on Government Procurement, which is one of the oldest and largest uh, regional networks on the topic. And this is an excellent way that I think we have 31 member countries and to share knowledge and to harmonize thinking about public procurement. Um, so that's in training and amongst other activities. The other way we work with other donors um, is through the MAPS, or the Methodology for the Assessment of Procurement Systems. The new version of this is coming out um, this year, as most of us is know, uh, being piloted in Norway, Chile, and Senegal, and it's been carried out in 90 countries, the original version. So this has really, again, helped uh, the, the different donor community harmonize our thinking in terms of what constitutes a successful procurement system. And then we also work with other donors um, when we, we often con conduct these assessments uh, jointly, um, which is important because then we can harmonize our support um, when, when, the, when we support the country in the procurement reform. Perfect. We, we um, learned a lot about developing countries' perspective, but um, I wanted to know a little bit more about the U.S. Uh, perspective, and here we have uh, Rob, who's been working on this issue uh, for many years. Uh, you represent a lot of U.S. contractors from defense to small business. What are some of the challenges that you see uh, in, in the United States uh, with you know, the U.S. procurement system, and uh, what are things that need you know, maybe reform um, from the U.S. side, yep. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Just by way of background, I served uh, in the United States government for over 30 years, and I ended my career in the Office of Federal Procurement Policy, uh, which is in the executive office of the president, and it actually is the office that pronounces what uh, policies are going to be used in the United States for uh, procurement. And uh, they chair what's called the Federal Acquisition Regulatory Council. It's the body that actually promulgates all these regulations that govern uh, the U.S. procurement system. And uh, we have over 2,000 pages, you know, in those regulations. And, of course, every agency is special, so they supplement the um, regulations. So it uh, goes on and on and on with respect to the number of regulations. So you think that we'd have it all down by now, right? After decades and decades of perfecting the system, you think that there wouldn't be any problems in the U.S. system. And I will say, and I, uh, I had the privilege uh, when I was in the United States uh, government to chair a... Uh, international Forum on Procurement Best Practices. It was uh, sponsored by the OECD, uh, the Organization for Economic and uh, co uh, Economic Cooperation and Development, over in Paris. And um, it was interesting because a lot of the developing countries, in particular, um, were somewhat amused, you know, about the the problems that the United States faces. You know, and they say things like, you, know, "You guys are so worried about competition and transparency. We just want to make sure we don't have bribery." You know, I mean, that's what we're focused on. Uh, you guys have a much more sophisticated system, and you can deal with all these esoteric things and have 2,000 pages of regulations and so forth. But our our goals are much more modest uh, than yours. But I do think the United States system is viewed as somewhat of a model by other countries, and we have a lot of lessons learned. And I think right now, if I would just highlight some of the challenge that, challenges of the U.S. system, uh, and some of the cries for reform, uh, it's always interesting, too. It's like a pendulum. You know, you'll see these, the pendulum swinging back and forth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one area where I was very uh, active in trying to do a paradigm shift in thinking was on what is referred to as best value procurements. So we would spend an enormous amount of time training procurement personnel and so forth to just try to think differently here. Don't think about low price. 
Uh, and the government really wanted to move away from what was called low price, technically acceptable LPTA. It was like, whoa, we don't want to do that stuff. And we spent all this time talking about best value and trade off between cost and technical capacity, and it's not all about price, right? I mean, get the low price, you may have a piece of junk, and uh, that may not be what your military necessarily wants. Um, and uh, now, in recent years, the pendulum started swinging back in the last decade, started swinging back to low price, technically acceptable. And the word from higher management was buy everything low price. You know, what are you doing? You know, we want low price. We've got some budget problems here. Um, and so the, the pendulum was swinging back to that arena. Under the Trump administration, I see it now moving back to best value. You know, we want a good deal. You know, we want a good deal. We don't necessarily want the low price, but that wouldn't be bad. But um, it's all about the deal, the art of the deal. So this is the, the idea of moving to back to best value, and the emphasis there is uh, very in vogue right now. But with respect to one of the biggest challenges I see, um, you know, in the commercial world, you know, people that do commercial procurements look at the United States government, they go, you know, what is the problem? Why is it so difficult for you people to purchase something? You know, you have to make everything complicated. And you know, it's really true. So back in 1994, Congress passed what was called FASA, the uh, Federal Acquisition Streamlining Act. That sounds good. Um, FASA. And that was the idea of the government purchasing like you purchase, you know, like just easy. You go into Walmart and you buy something, you know, it's not that complicated. So a whole, a whole idea of the government being more commercial-like. So that really, boy, everybody was all excited about that. And so back in 1995, when they actually implemented that law, that streamlining law, there were 17 contract clauses applying to commercial item procurements, as the government defined it. Now today, and starting in 2017, that number is now 58 contract clauses applying to commercial item procurements. So Congress is like, well, what happened here in the last 20 years? I mean, what, what, what went wrong? Why are we complicating commercial item procurement? And so the, the, and if you look at some of the acquisition reform provisions in this year's National Defense Authorization Act, every year look out for the acquisition section in that uh, law. Every year you'll, you'll see uh, acquisition reform provisions in what's called the NDAA the National Defense Authorization Act. This year, uh, Congress said, hey, go back and take a look at all these contract clauses and see what ones you can, let's get, maybe go back to 17 again. Uh, you know, why do we need 58? Why are we complicating what should be easy? And really what's happened now in the technology world, the government just can't keep up, right? I mean, now you've got Amazon, you've got people, you know, buying stuff with two days delivery, you know, it's really easy. And uh, a lot of people are saying, well, why can't the government do that? At least with respect to low dollar purchases. If you're buying pens and paper or whatever, if, you know, if it's below what's called the simplified acquisition threshold, can't you guys like purchase just the way people do at home on the weekend, you know, on Amazon uh, or whatever uh, portal you want to talk about, e-commerce portals. That's the end thing now, right? I mean, that is the end thing. The commercial world is moving much faster than government. And so now, in the NDAA for this year, you'll see a um, government pushing for a pilot and having GSA head up a pilot with respect to uh, purchasing in what's called an e-commerce portal uh, in, in an Amazon-like fashion, if you will. Um, and the government, I think, is really sort of anxious in a way to, to make it simpler because uh, what's happening? A lot of large companies don't want to deal with the federal government. So a lot of innovative commercial companies, and there are a lot out there now. You know, when I was a kid, you know, it was like everybody had to deal with the federal government. They spend over $500 billion a year. You want to have a government contract. <clears throat> and there's still a, a large amount of that feeling, but not as much. So you have these innovative commercial companies that don't need the federal government, quite frankly. And so they're like, they're like, we want to deal with you on our terms, not your terms. So you need to start thinking about commercial terms, not government terms. And this is really starting to catch hold. Um, there's been also a move to even do away with the federal acquisition regulation for certain companies that want, they want to try to track to the government space and use what's called other transactions. That's basically outside the legal framework and the regulatory framework. You're seeing more of that now. And that's because these powerful, innovative commercial companies are basically saying, do it my way or we don't come to the table. The government's never had to deal with that before. It's like, what are you talking about? We're the federal government. Um, and so now you're seeing a lot more flexibility 
Uh, and I think you're going to see more of this. A lot of this pilot um, um, language that you see in the NDAA really is all about purchasing commercial items in a commercial way. Why does the government have to complicate things? So we've come a long way, though. I want to know this, because in, when I was in the Department of Defense, I began my career in the Department of Defense, and we had what are called military specifications. And we would have these detailed specifications for things like toothbrushes. Uh, you know, there would be 15 pages describing a toothbrush, and that would be accompanied by a diagram at the end, which you actually had to pull out. You know, the diagram you had to pull out, and it was this special, this toothbrush, but I got news for you. It's the same toothbrush you and I go to the store and buy, but it sounded different. You know, it sounded special, uh, but it had, you know, maybe it had one more bristle. I don't know, but it was like... But really, what a waste of, a really unbelievable waste of time and money. And so, guess what happened, right? The, the taxpayers paid more for that toothbrush than the one you buy at CVS. And so, uh, the government started going, wait a minute, why are we paying $200 for a toothbrush? Well, that's because you have 17 pages of specifications in like this uh, diagram. And so, the government has moved away, f at least from that type of obsession, that everything that the government buys ha had to be different than what the commercial world buy buys. That has changed, and so now we are moving more to become more commercial-like. You know, there's definitely an acquisition reform movement to try, at least, to do it in a more simple way. But the government has a hard time, you know, making things simple. And uh, so there's an outcry, you know, with some of these acquisition reform provisions that people are going, oh, my goodness, you can't do that. That would be too simple. You know, and uh, there's a big debate. There's a big public debate right now with respect to how, how should the government purchase in a commercial way. Uh, the government doesn't necessarily want to do it in exactly the way you and I do it. Um, and so uh, it does somewhat cost more, that, you know, to, uh, to purchase things. The other big theme, I would just say, is in the training world. You know, training has been an issue for decades, trying to train procurement personnel on all of these regulations. But the government finally um, realized it's not just about procurement. You know, we use the word procurement to talk about our procurement professionals. But there's this other group called program managers. And they are all over the place in every federal agency. And they are the ones that have a lot of say with respect to the development of requirements, with the development of the acquisition. So the government now likes to use the word acquisition uh, because it encompasses both procurement and program management. And we now in the federal government view those two central ingredients to comprise what's called acquisition. Well, lo and behold, uh, Congress figured out that, gee, the federal government really doesn't spend any time training program managers. They don't even have job series dedicated to program managers. And to the extent there is a job series that's de de dedicated to program management, it says there are no, no criteria or requirements associated with this job series. Uh, so anybody can be dumped into that job series. Um, it's not, was not viewed as a profession. So the government just last year passed a law called the Program Management Improvement and Accountability Act. Get that word accountability in there. And um, it's all about trying to professionalize the program management workforce in the federal government because suddenly it was, the federal government realized we have all of these folks that are not really trained, they're not trained in acquisition, they probably should know something about procurement and writing requirements for solicitations. That whole effort now is ongoing to have a council at the president's, uh, at the White House that will be called the Program Management Improvement Council, trying to actually improve the way we buy and manage things. It's, it's all part of acquisition reform. But it took the government a long time to realize that program management was part of acquisition and that you really couldn't just focus on procurement. You had to also, you have to also focus on these folks called program managers. They have to be a profession, they have to be trained, and they have to work with the procurement people very closely. And that wasn't necessarily, or is not happening today. So there's a move afoot to try to bring the program managers into the acquisition community and treat them more uh, as a profession, which simply had not been done. Which then, when your politicians say, how come this program's not on time, it's not within budget, you know, what's wrong with you people? Uh, a lot of times it's not the procurement folks' 
problem. It's really the program manager's problem. And a lot of folks in the government simply don't manage programs well. Um, but oftentimes the procurement people are blamed for it uh, un, un, unnecessarily so. So this is another whole area where I think you've seen a lot of attention is improving program management in the federal government. And it sort of goes to the art of the deal and trying to get um, projects on time within budget. That really is sort of the, the whole focus of the acquisition system is to get better value for the American taxpayers. Uh, so it's all related. Data has always been a problem. We have, we're talking up here a lot about data. Uh, the federal procurement data system is probably one of the biggest procurement data systems in the world. It has lots and lots of information. Uh, but it's not necessarily correct. And so a lot of the information is incorrect in the system. It's only as good, the data is only as good as the people that are putting in the data. And um, so it's hard for government officials to rely on that data to make business decisions when it's incorrect. Um, and how to improve that has been an, a nightmare. It's been an ongoing battle. It's still not there yet. Uh, but it's uh, an ongoing challenge that the United States government has is on the quality of the data that it has. Lots of data, but the quality is questionable. So that continues to be an area where uh, uh, it's a problem. As we move into trying to simplify things and trying to buy things more commercial-like, data becomes a big issue. It's like, well, we still have to have our data. You know, we still need to know exactly where the dollars are going and what they're being spent on and so forth. Our small business is getting the contracts. All this anal data analytics is still very important to the government. So some of these commercial, uh, innovative commercial companies are now trying to tailor some of their offerings um, with that data analytics available to the government, because the government's got to have that data. And more so than you and I uh, are dying for that data. And it goes back to the fundamental notion that government procurement's not the same as commercial procurement. It is different, and it never will be the same. So commercial people are always like, why can't the government do it like we do? But the problem is you're spending taxpayer money. There is more accountability. Uh, the government system is different. Can it be more commercial-like? Sure. But can it, all, can it ever be identical? Probably not. And that's the, the problem is the balance, uh, trying to get that delicate balance, which is uh, very difficult indeed. And I think we learn a lot. We've learned a lot from other countries as well. I mean, I think the U.S. system certainly is not perfect, and there's certainly best practices that can be shared uh, from other countries. Uh, and I, I certainly learned that when I was um, dealing with some this particular international forum. Um, other countries' experiences are very valuable, and I think best practices and identifying best practices on an international level and sharing those practices uh, benefits the United States government as, as well. So I will pause there and turn it back to you. Thank you, Rob, for that. Um, I just have three open-ended questions, and then we'll uh, turn to the audience. Uh, I'm not going to cold call anybody, so uh, these are very general questions. But the first question that comes to mind, um, how can a regular Joe, a regular Romina, a regular citizen push for uh, you know, better procurement systems? Uh, how can we as taxpayers uh, ensure that our taxes are being uh, used efficiently and, and transparently, transparently? That's our, like a first question. The second question is, is there any role um, in procurement system regarding the sharing economy? I mean, is there any role for government in the sharing economy? And the third is, what are some um, key innovations that you see happening, um, as, you know, aside from technology um, in, in, in procurement? And just please be brief, and anybody can answer um, one or two or three. Yeah, I'm happy to start with the first one, looking a little bit more in like how citizens can engage with, with that information. And I think it really goes back to which is the information that they're interested in. And, um, um, and thinking about like how government and, um, and citizens can work together on providing the information that is relevant. So if you look at the cycle of procurement information, you see that business is mostly interested in tenders and, and potentially contracts and like where these areas are. Well, citizens are really interested in the implementation phase. Is like the street that is built in front of my, my house actually sort of being delivered? Do I get the, the medicines or do I, or, or do I not? Um, so looking at connecting um, the, the different information data, well, one way is to make sure that information is available so they can actually start following up and they actually do that if that information is available. So in Paraguay, students went on the streets 
um, because they found that the, the Ministry of Education said there was no money for, um, you know, for education for new teachers and others, but they were spending overpriced costs for, um, for catering contracts and everything. And they actually got the minister to resign because they said, well, you know, here's something not, not happening right. So like, just that information is important. But beyond that, there, there are much better ways and, you know, initiatives like the Construction Sector Transparency Initiative and others sort of work with citizens and providing these feedback loops and looking at like, you know, here's the contract, but here's the implementation phase. And that, um, and, and this is like how this is, this is happening. And then um, there's, there's very good examples where you have uh, civil society monitors, you have regular processes, um, and using technology facilitates that in many ways, but um, often it's also about just going um, out into other areas and then looking if this is actually happening. One of the things that is useful there, I think that's something that we haven't really managed before, is that some of the problems with innovation is that they happen in silos and then you have a really cool system that does you know, just do one thing. And I think that's something that we see a lot in the more developed company, countries where there have been a lot of work on this. Um, but a lot of the information that is gathered through those systems um, is in silos. So using, and I just reiterate that using open data, making that information available in standardized formats will help you connect information. And if you look at the procurement cycle, it's important to be able to connect information from budgets to the procurement process to the spending data and also making sure that you connect the, um, the country, company registers so that gov governments really know like where the money going, but you can also like follow the money from like, you know, you spend that much on your budget, but actually you should have spent that much more or that much less, or, you know, then you can use that information to take policy decisions of increasing funding where it's needed. So I think that's, uh, that's an interesting way of where, um, where you see citizens engaging in, you know, this is an issue that I care about, where is the information in the education department? And then, you know, I raise, I raise the question about this. Um, maybe just a, a brief point. I'm, I'm actually quite interested in like looking at connecting um, procurement to other areas of development because as you know, as you mentioned, there's sort of these things of like, well, it, it works somewhere else. Why doesn't it work in government? So I mean, you know, in the end, I think there could be models like the sharing economy of saying like, well, we only need um, certain machinery for a certain time. Maybe it's more about um, not buying the whole thing, but um, but sort of renting it. So I think it could be interesting to, to think about models like that. And other areas are, are blockchain where we see some early case studies coming out, um, like GSA has done some interesting work on that um, recently. However, um, again, it goes back to like, you know, think about the user first, think about um, the information that you want to make public and think about making it as easy as possible and don't overcomplicate things. And I think we're still a bit of a way of, um, being blocked into a blockchain, uh, for example, in terms of innovations coming out. But you know, it's, these are things that we need to discuss and we need to see um, how they fit with, um, with capacities and, um, and information availability and user needs in the end um, and how we can make them work. Yeah, building on what just uh, George said, uh, uh, obviously information is a very is a viable part of uh, uh, of actually making people and citizens aware. Uh, in terms of from the citizen's point of view, uh, at the NGO and media plays, plays a certain role and it will definitely make it easier when, as you said, it's the procurement data is connected to a lot of other, uh, a lot of uh, uh, information sets like company registers, as we said. Uh, however, I would like to say that from a regular job kind of company level in terms of uh, small, med small and medium businesses. Uh, there is definitely, again, information plays a crucial role, but uh, there, there, there is a lot that could be done from small business actually united in consortiums of businesses or uh, looking for their uh, rights, Have, making sure that assessment, final offer assessment methodology is not restrictive because this is, uh, this is a problem and pushing really, really for a change. I believe businesses could could, could do a lot in, in, in changing the rules. Uh, in, in terms of technology, of course, uh, we, we mentioned some of it. Uh, we believe at the company monitor and with our partners that uh, vendor, uh, innovative vendor assessment is, is very, very, very uh, important. Actually, as a, uh, and they are, we see governments actually looking at who they're 
providing the, their money, taxpayers' money to. So vendor assessment as informative uh, as possible. Uh, of course, when we talk about uh, we, we mentioned electronic procurement, but he, here it's important to understand that uh, we have in a lot, maybe all the countries that we discussed here, maybe nearly 50 countries, there's somewhat of e-notification systems, but not full transaction digitalization from uh, initial uh, from the uh, initial preparation from the buyer, then the offer submission and final assessment is not fully done online, but in, in many countries, in, uh, including the US, UK, and a lot of developed countries, uh, this is still not, uh, uh, not the case, and here smaller countries actually could do more about that. Um, of course, in terms of, uh, and, and why is this important for transparency, for example, having information on who has been bidding. So all the bidders with their offers, with exact price quotes, it's a whole different game. I mean, it, it, it changes the information, then you could see why a certain company has been uh, picked. Uh, going, going away from that, I believe that uh, procurement is really a repetitive process, so there is a lot of room for uh, related to administrative, uh, uh, to, to building more administrative capacities and a lot of room to actually automize, automate the process as much as possible uh, and we implement uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence in actually making, because sometimes we see that there are countries that have very good systems, some of them were mentioned, Ukraine, Chile, etc. Even in the United States, uh, as Robert said, there is uh, the, the, the federal system is quite comprehensive in terms of data that is being reported, but uh, the quality is not always there and it's, there is a, lo a lot to be done. Um, and uh, I believe that's, uh, that's pretty, uh, for, for sharing economy and any uh, kind of, it's, it has become kind of fashionable, even bit, uh, the Bitcoin technology, the blockchain technology has been used in, in procurement. I believe that uh, someone mentioned earlier that in, uh, in Europe and in the USA, there is, for, for smaller purchases under a certain threshold, I believe uh, governments could actually uh, do something more innovative and, and try uh, and use those, even sharing, as you said, blockchain technology, etc. because above certain threshold, I believe this will not be possible, not, not at this point. To add to that, yes. Um, I think there's three parts to the equation. The first is governments need to do their part, as George was mentioning, fostering an enabling environment. It's important to empower citizens, for example, enhancing legal frameworks to allow information sharing, because many procurement officers feel, oftentimes feel, historically feel nervous about sharing information and where that's gonna go. And then finally, something that's, you know, once citizens are able to get and understand the information, it becomes much easier for them to take action. And then finally, the third part of the equation that's often overlooked is the control and audit institutions. They need to be aware of these new practices and, uh, and methods so that procurement can be efficient and more bureaucratic. And I think that's an important component. And if I may just build off of that, I'm gonna combine your last two. Uh, one, looking at key innovations in procurement and the sharing economy because uh, from our point of view, I've, I've worked with uh, 14 countries now and over and actually five different regions across the world. And I will tell you the one thing that they're coming to is hitting on this shared economy. And, and how do we build a government where we can share services and cut down the transaction cost involved with how we do these contracts in the government? Um, and as I'm sure that anybody who's worked in the government, I've worked in the U.S. government, there are, so I, I still work in, the, I hope I still have a job when I get back to the office today. <laughs> um, but there are transaction costs involved with every procurement. And if you wanna talk about efficiency, we gotta look at how we then cut the time it takes to do one of these procurements and, and try to satisfy that constituent base that wants us to do it faster, more like a business. Um, but what, what I can tell you that countries are most interested in um, these days are framework agreements, is what it's referred to more internationally. Here in the United States, we call it indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contracts, um, where we can create these umbrella contracts to provide certain services and goods 
over an extended period of time, therefore you do the, the competition and then you issue task orders underneath it, um, that is becoming extremely popular. Um, I, I get questions from every government on how we do it and, and GSA, is, as we refer to it, their schedules, that is an example of a framework contract, how we can all buy pens and paper very easily from the GSA without having to go through this rigorous competition comp process because they've already done it. They've already established the umbrella contracts and, the, and we just issue task orders underneath it. Um, that is one of the most popular topics. But what you also realize, even in the U U.S. government, there's a huge push because of our constrained budget. How do we share services amongst our departments? And every government is faced with constrained budgets. And so this whole notion of how do we share services, how do we create these shared platforms, how do we do everything from IT services contracts and maintenance contracts and share it amongst ministries and departments to cut down on overall cost, get economies of scales, and then cut down on the transaction cost to the government. That is one of the key issues that I see um, and that comes up in every training that I've done. And we've done 17 trainings in country uh, just in the last three years. Uh, and I've trained over 880 officials just in the last three years. So this is the number one issue that comes up, I would say, consistently across the board. Perfect. Uh, we have about 15 minutes uh, for Q&A. So if uh, you have any questions, uh, the, the uh, uh, ladies in the back have mics. Um, so or comments. The gentleman here and the gentleman over there. Oh, and the lady. Sure. Maybe we'll start with the lady, of course. <laughs> I raised my hand last. But Emmy, <laughs> Emmy Simmons, former USAID, uh, the Agency for International Development, and obviously a lot of work in program management and, and acquisition, as you, as you called it. Um, the, one of the issues that constantly came up in USAID was the difference between services and goods, and how you, in fact, determine the value of the services that you're going to be that you're contracting for, and how you report that back in terms of accountability. Um, I wondered if any of you guys have some ideas about sort of distinguishing how doing that value for money calculation and ensuring ta account finance taxpayer in the case of the public sector taxpayer accountability for services as opposed to goods. We'll take three questions and then, um, yeah, the, sorry, the gentleman. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm Michael Davidson. I, I'm the manager with the Covia Scandinavian Consulting Firm. And we do quite a lot of work with the IDB and the World Bank and the MCC in the past. So the developing countries, I think it's, uh, it's very nice that CSI put procurement on the, on the agenda because procurement is, generally speaking, not that interesting. It's <laughs> uh, now, I also think it's a very complex uh, issue and the, the complexity is not just in the procurement rules and engagement, it's like the actual the implementation level and who's in behind the evaluation committee and who's the stakeholders and what is the stakeholders uh, KPIs in addition to all the other kinds of things. So it's much more complicated. I've, I kind of say it's almost like the political economy. I mean, you have to address political economy and not just not just the procurement rules and regulations and reforms. And I think the challenge is that the World Banks of the world, the IFIs of the world, has a hard time realizing that. So that's one thing. So we can all, so I, what I'm often saying is the procurement rules is a little bit like an instrument. You can play the instrument well, or you can play it not so well, or you can be a beginner or an advanced player. So the, the rules and regulations is one thing. You have to, um, to also look at the, you know, the political economy. And then from a service provider's point of view, eventually we like to get paid. So we've had some experiences in, in, in developing countries which were worked under World Bank contracts and they were quite significant size contracts. At the end of the day, no one wants to pay us. And then we kind of, we have delivered a, you know, a pretty decent, I would say above average service. It was the service and not the goods. And you know, either they was not happy f with who we were at that time after three years or maybe they ran out of money, we don't know. But when I was going to the World Bank to the IFIs of the world, they said, well, sorry, we're not part of your contract. That is something that you really have to discuss with your counterpart, the government implementing agency. And I think that is a really, really kind of difficult. So in our case, in that one country, we were about four years ago, we were 100 professional staff. About 80% was nationals. 
Today that office is reduced to 40%, so we're about 40% there. And that's kind of not a nice story to talk about private sector not getting paid for, for services that otherwise was uh, awarded in a transparent fashion. And I, I kind of think that the IFIs and the World Banks and the IDBs need to find a way to engage in contracts and not just kind of saying, we're not part of the contract. So, thank you. Thank you. The gentleman over there. Uh, thank you. My name is Bob Wirtz. I also used to be with USAID. And the title of this was uh, Procurement as a Driver for Growth. And I, I was curious of whether, whether or not in your experience, you know, you were able to address that chicken and the egg problem. Is it, is it that you have reformers out there who look at procurement as a way to increase growth further and they adopt it? Or is it the other way where you have uh, countries trying to get up and uh, increase their growth, trying to become reformers, and this is one of the first things uh, that, they, uh, that they try out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so three questions. Um, anybody want to start with the goods versus services issue? I could say just briefly, you've hit on one of the key things. Uh, we, we, we face here in the U.S. government as an AID, and we, most of what AID and, and even what USTDA, what we deal with is services. Uh, so how do you then distinguish between goods and services? Because it's easy to, to rate and, and be, be held accountable for purchasing of goods. Yes, I ordered X amount. Yes, I got it. Yes, I got it on time. It was within budget. And yes, it was in good quality. Stamp. That's your approval and send it on. Now, services, how do you then rate it? And that, this is the key, is because when you're purchasing goods, you can be much more objective about what has been received. When you're purchasing services, it is subjective of the one who is actually doing the review. And what you say might be good, I might say may be bad, but we have developed standards, and this is the key, standard by which you can, can develop these services. And in most countries, they're developing these uh, rules that actually are special for the purchase of services because in that case perhaps services of a more qualified individual with 20 years of experience and, and whatnot might be what is needed for that particular job or for that particular uh, whatever service contract you're letting. Um, do I want necessarily someone with only one year of experience operating on me without some supervision? Maybe not. In certain cases, I'd want somebody with a little bit more experience, depending upon what's needed. So the problem with service contracts is that internationally, they'll, they'll point out, is that there's a great deal more subjectivity involved and you have to have greater flexibility in those contracts, but also oversight to make sure that, that the, the government is actually getting the best quality and the best services. And then how do you then make a record of what the government has received and, what, and, and how that record should be um, developed? Uh, because we're, at, like I said, for goods, it's very straightforward. For services, you can use some of the same metrics, but yet it is a little bit more subjective. And so you kind of have to formalize how you're going to rate that and measure that and then provide the, the person providing the services a way to uh, rebut if they, they don't agree with how they, their services have been rated by that individual. So it's a, it's a little bit more iterative process on services. So one thing you're finding is that Congress is, does not want to be terribly innovative when it comes to services. So a lot of what I was speaking about with respect to pilots at GSA and trying to purchase in a more commercial-like way all of that is just dealing with the pr um, product. You know, they do not want to move into being innovative with services. So all of this experimental or innovative approaches to procurement are, is going to start with just your basic product. And so they don't want to use an Amazon-like pr process for services. And what's challenging about services, which uh, I think Andrea alluded to, is is that the, the definition, the requirement definition becomes critical. And so the way those requirements are written um, becomes very important, much more so than if you're buying a toothbrush. And you do have to have detailed description. And agencies are not good at this. One thing I've noticed throughout my career, 
agencies are very bad about writing good requirements, and it usually is dealing with the procurement of services. So you get into all sorts of litigious situations uh, where those requirements are not well defined and contractors don't know really what services are you asking for. The definitional uh, challenges are huge when it comes to the procurement of services, not so much with the procurement of product. So it allows for us to be a little bit more innovative and try new things when we're talking about procurement of products, not so much with the procurement of services. And that's going to be, that's just, it, there, it is a different animal. And even though to this day, to today you can buy services off the GSA schedules, I mean they finally entered into the GSA schedules and so you can buy services off the schedules, it's very problematic and you get into a lot of legal uh, debate and challenges when you're dealing with the procurement of services on the GSA schedules. It's much more complicated. No, I think, and starting as well with the services question, I think it's it's the, the part where you have to work most with civil society. You have to really think about um, levels of quality that you want to achieve and how that impacts value for money that you get. No? If you cut down prices on um, hospitals or school meals, you will get worse quality, which in fact means that you know your services will be bad. No? If you want, so you will have to find a balance that, and you will probably have to work with civil society in um, those specifications so that you can work on that. So I think that's actually one of the, the, the most interesting areas where we still lack of, in, in terms of innovation, of finding good ways of connecting um, the monitoring of those services and like the uh, and, and like how you use the crowd to balance out subjectivity and and feed that back in into contract management, payment scheduling, and others. No? And I think it's been done in public-private partnerships to a certain degree, but I think there's more that we can do to make sure that that's done fairly. Um, on the question of uh, driver for growth, I think that goes really back to the to the Ukraine example because one of the key reasons they decided we want to overcome this corrupt system is to bring back our SMEs and bring back our own Ukrainian companies and engage them through, um, through the state in part of the process and increase their confidence in that doing business with government is actually not a burden, but it's actually something that makes sense for me as a company. And they are seeing this. They've seen um, these increases of 50% of uh, companies going into And I mean, if you look at um, a lot of the IT companies and other companies, they are now interested in pushing for um, Eastern European expansion. So the Ukrainian government goes to the Polish and says, well, um, you really should think about how you open up your data so that, because our Ukrainian companies are now interested in uh, working with the Polish government as well, et cetera. So there is a lot of sort of, and they've been like working with the trade association, trade um, WTO um, and the, the general procurement agency there. Um, association um, on like trying to increase that as well because they see this as an opportunity of driving growth of their own com companies. It's definitely an issue of um, you know how much do you balance national interest versus international interest. I think in Europe you see that a lot, especially in the northern countries where you, the Germans aren't really interested in providing a fully open system because that they know that all the, com the companies from Eastern Europe might come in and bid better than the Germans do, so or cheaper, and still provide good quality. So I think there is a bit of a of a balancing act that um, that happens uh, there as well, um, and I and I think sort of the the political economy question. I think it's it's this whole question of like yeah, procurement is not just about buying something; it's about like how do you think about um, you know, what policies do you want to come out of it? And depending on the policies, you will have to, you will have to um, work with the different stakeholders and um, on, on thinking about, yeah, how much do I outsource? How much do I do myself? How, um, how do I qualify certain levels of, of procurement? How do I do the specifications? No? So I think there is a circle that needs to happen. Um, and, and, you know, talking about political questions, I think one of the key issues that we see this year, especially in Latin America, is looking at the link between companies' donations and political campaigns um, and how you can um, make this just more transparent of knowing that, you know, if companies bid then on projects that, uh, um, that are promoted by certain um, parties, I think that that will show you making this transparent, I think is one of the key issues that we'll be looking at. So there's a lot of political questions uh, around procurement that is that are still hidden um, um, beyond just buying pencils. Oh, sorry, sorry. 
no, real quick, I just wanted to follow up on what you were saying. Um, I mean, if you can, a lot of the, the reforms and the things that we support in the, in the region are with regards to simplifying procedures, and that makes it a lot easier for, say, small and medium-sized enterprises to participate in the public procurement market. And if you take into account the size of the public procurement market, then you can really see that can, uh, that can be a driver of growth. And that can also be a driver of growth. Um, uh, one of the topics that we've been focusing on the IDB is the participation of women in the public procurement market. And uh, women own business, women's businesses tend to be smaller, medium sized enterprises. So if you want to level the playing field and make it easier for them to participate, some of these types of reforms um, can do it. For example, um, enabling small to comply on online, you don't have to hire a lawyer, you know, all these things that make it, if you're a small firm, that make it easier to participate. And I think that's where you really have the power of technology for development by um, you know, opening new windows of opportunity for, for disadvantaged groups. Yes, just really quickly uh, on the growth question and whether it comes, uh, procurement comes before growth or not. Uh, it definitely, public procurement, it takes a certain level of market economy development to engage, to have public procurement, to have really competitive bidding procedures uh, for procuring goods and services on behalf of the government. Uh, however, even for the countries that we are monitoring that have that certain level of development, of market economy development, uh, I don't know if it's if it's a growth instrument, but it's definitely sometimes the only source of business. Uh, and uh, especially there are sectors and in, in the countries that we, we've monitored in Eastern Europe, in Latin America, uh, that there are sectors that simply 80%, there are statistics sometimes going on, 80% of business you only comes from the government. And uh, which on the negative side, uh, uh, first shows the significance of public procurement in those countries and in certain sectors on the negative side, side definitely fuels rent sinking behavior on, terms, on, on behalf of the state, also pushes for certain lobbying for, 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 for companies. But I don't think this is the problem of public procurement, as, uh, as the gentleman said, it goes beyond that. It's about political economy, it's about uh, the fact that it goes to public-private partnerships, uh, the fact that, for example, uh, 99% of any road construction there is public. There is no private initiatives. There is there are laws that are kind of uh, uh, banning or, or just uh, obstructing any any initiatives in terms of uh, in terms of public infrastructure development. For example, there are, uh, there are the same examples in energy, in the pharmaceutical sector. So. Uh, Often it, it, it is the case that government just is the only the sole source of, of business for a lot of for a lot of companies. So it creates growth. It also creates sometimes uh, uh, dot uh, uh, suspicious activity and uh, rent sinking behavior. But it's uh, definitely something with huge significance for 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 sectors and for countries. You know, I might, uh, I might just note that one of the challenges that the United States government is facing right now is attracting more small businesses to the federal procurement system. So one of the trends this last decade or so has been a decrease in the number of small business participation uh, in federal procurement. Uh, as you know, the one reason our, public, our procurement system is different than the private sector is that we uh, the government tries to further certain economic and social goals through the procurement process, one of those being increasing the dollars flowing to small businesses. But the government, I think, has made a big mistake. You know, it has been evaluating its success or failure with respect to that social goal based on the number of dollars flowing to small business. And really, uh, you need to look at also the number of small businesses participating. So even though the government has declared victory in recent years that they have met their small business goals, those goals are defined with respect to the amount of money going to small businesses. But it might be just 10 small businesses as opposed to 100 small businesses. So what we have seen is actually the number of small businesses participating in that revenue actually decreasing. And so that's a huge challenge. And one reason it's decreasing is some of these 
innovative efforts to do sharing, to actually have agencies have one procurement vehicle and then other agencies use that procurement vehicle, it actually reduces the number of opportunities. You're reducing the number of contracts, you're reducing the number of opportunities for small business as well as larger business too, by the way. So this whole idea of efficiency and the idea of less procurement vehicles and the sharing of procurement vehicles actually is not necessarily a good thing. It actually could result in less competition, could less uh, result in less opportunity for small businesses in particular. And actually, it's already shown to be that's shown to be the case already. And there was un, one other note I wanted to make that I thought it was interesting. The audience might enjoy this. You know, as we sit here and we talk about growth and we talk about the economy and we talk about uh, saving money and so forth and so on, which is all these uh, great goals that uh, politicians in particular have. There's somewhat an irony that Accenture recently did a study that showed that if you could improve the efficiency of government programs by just 1%, just a 1% improvement in the efficiency of government programs, it would translate in a trillion dollars of savings over the next 10 years. Think about that. And as, the, as you see these politicians trying to decide how on earth are we going to get rid of this deficit, you know, look at this horrible budget crisis that we have. No one really talks about increasing the efficiency of government programs. You know, it's, just, it's not, not all that interesting. It doesn't sound that interesting. And, and, and do voters really think about efficiency? You know, no. Um, and so back to one of your questions on how do you get the citizenry, citizenry involved, the general citizenry is not involved in public procurement. Uh, they don't really care about it. Unless you are a contractor doing business with the government, then you are up on Capitol Hill and you're making your voice known. And it might be interesting, too, for the audience to know that there are over 100 caucuses in the United States House of Representatives. There's the Wine Caucus, the Cancer Caucus. There's every caucus that you can envision. One was founded a couple of years ago called the Government Efficiency Caucus only caucus ever dedicated to the efficiency of government programs. It only has 30 congressional members. Uh, they cannot get people to join that particular caucus. Um, why is that? Because there's no constituency. When congressmen go back home, they don't really want to talk about the efficiency of the USAID program for whatever. You know, it's not of interest. Um, you know, you want to talk about what your constituency happened to be doing, if they're growing wine or whatever, um, you know, growing grapes. But I mean, that's what you're going to be talking about. Uh, and that's why you have 100 caucuses on every topic you can imagine but for government efficiency. And I think that says a lot. And I'm just intrigued to think that if the government would focus on improving the efficiency of government by just 1%, we probably could get rid of the deficit rather quickly. Well, thank you for that. If there's any other questions or comments, um, otherwise, I want to thank the panelists. The procurement is a very sexy and cool topic and interesting, so uh, we hope to do more of this in the future. Um, and thank you all for, for being here, and uh, let's give uh, a round of applause to the panelists. <laughs>